Uh, hello, Professor Norman, uh, and welcome to this session. To introduce um, Professor Norman to the audience, he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Physics in San Diego Supercomputing Center, uh, I'm sorry, in the Department of uh, Physics in UC San Diego. And until about a week ago, he was the director of the San Diego Supercomputing Center. Uh, the reason why he is of particular interest to this community is that he's among the pioneers of the open source movement in the sense that long before anyone else thought of, he released his code publicly and in, in some ways set the standard in the area of computational astrophysics, which has evolved into something um, that I intend to ask him about during the course of this interview. Um, welcome, Professor Norman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you are among the pioneers of the of open sourcing and public making your code publicly available. Uh, would you share with us what motivated you to do so? Yeah, um, I was a graduate student at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory from 1975 to 1980. And I was actually located in a code development group. Um, and um, so that's how I learned about the concept of code development and a code development team. Uh, this code development group was not focused on astrophysics, but the codes were very applicable to astrophysics. So that's how I learned about computational astrophysics. Um, Paul Woodward, the uh, co-inventor of PPM was at Livermore at the same time. Uh, and he and I would get together weekly and talk about numerical methods for fluid dynamics. And he was developing the PPM algorithm at the time. This is before the paper was written. And so I learned all about PPM, uh, but when I asked for him a cop for for a copy of the code, he wouldn't share it with me. <laughs> oh, so um, that's really what motivated me to um, develop and share a community code. Is I, I just found it uh, frustrating to not be able to access the state of the art tools. So. This was very unusual for that time because even until about, I would say five or six years ago, there were many in the community who thought that not sharing their code or making it publicly, public, publicly available gives them um, competitive advantage. Uh, did that thought ever cross your mind? Um, well, I was certainly aware of that motivation to not share. Uh, Paul wasn't the only person who had a code I wanted. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be naming names, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there was something called Netlib. Uh, I think it was actually at Argonne National Lab mm -hmm. where people would put uh, public software out there. And um, I was very interested in, um, the Berger and Colella adaptive mesh refinement method. And Phil Colella would always promise that he's going to put it up on Netlib, and he never did. So, long story short, I had to write my own PPM code from scratch from the paper, and I had to write my own AMR code from scratch um, from the description. And so, that was another example of. Uh, you know, being frustrated by the lack of sharing. But, uh, you know, when I did, so the, my first community code was called Zeus. It was really an offshoot idea. of my PhD thesis code, uh -huh. which was a 2D Eulerian hydro code. And um, what I realized is if you have a code you're willing to share, you can collect collaborators. And so right. I, I, I made the decision when I was a postdoc in 1981 that I was going to take my thesis code and I was going to share it with collaborators and do more science that way. And that, that was really 
the start of the community code idea for me. Um, and I think that was also, I mean, the, I think there was one more code, an N-body code that was being made public at roughly the same time. But I think the two of you were pretty much the pioneers in at least the astrophysics community. And that really set the ball rolling because over the years, many, many community codes have been collected in this, in this particular community. Um, so by far, I mean, that's my perception of its impact on the community. What is your perception? Uh, yeah, I think you're referring to Sphere Arset's N-body code. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he shared that um, broadly and, you know, you saw a lot of science spring up around um, the application of that code. Um, now, in the early 80s, it wasn't that easy to share. I mean, just physically, how do you do it? This yes. is before the web. It's even before FTP servers. <laughs> right. So, um, but I, I, I had uh, a good graduate student by the name of Jim Stone, who was very good at co-development. And so that that's a very familiar name now. <laughs> Zeus 2D was yeah. the code that he and I wrote the, together. It was basically a rewrite and a generalization of my thesis code. And fortunately, <laughs> um, the World Wide Web appeared just as we were getting ready to share it. And so we created one of the first websites in 1992 using NCSA well, Mosaic. <laughs> I remember visiting that website. It was a lot of fun. And I remember the first site I visited was actually the Vatican. Was what? The Vatican. It had a website uh -huh. with Mosaic. Yes. Yeah. But uh, in your long career doing scientific software, uh, you have participated in teams that are that have been very small, your typical professor and uh, postdoc team, but also you've been part of ENZO, which eventually turned into a large community project and therefore had a large team involved. Plus, I remember that you used to be uh, one of the reviewers for Flash, which was turning into its own large code. And so, Given that the theme of this workshop is teams, I wanted to ask you um, if you noticed any difference between small teams and large teams and the way the dynamics played out. Yeah, I, I would say that um, the development of distributed version control software was the transformative uh, event. Um, these days we just think of GitHub, but um, when I first learned about it, we used Mercurial. Um, and that enables large teams to work asynchronously and um, you know make their contributions large and small. Um, before distributed soft version control, I had used everything, CVS, SVN, and you could never get the contributions back into the, the main branch. Even if people wanted to do it, the, mechanically it was difficult. Moreover, as the tree of collaborators grows, they're forking everything and they start collaborating within the uh, amongst themselves in small groupings. And so what I experienced uh, with the early days of the Enzo co code project, which we made uh, the first release in 2004 is, um, it was just branching speciation and it was just, uh, it, would, it was not really possible for a large team to work together effectively. Uh, then 2010, Matt Turk introduced me to distributed version control and more or less forced my hand to release Enzo to the community um, in that way. And 
then it just took off like crazy because people could uh, not just collaborate with me, they could collaborate with one another and all their contributions sitting in different branches could be pulled uh, willy nilly into whatever combination was needed. So I would say, and of course, GitHub was invented for Linux distributed uh, code development. So I would say the whole question of large team, small team, um, small teams can succeed without that kind of technology. Large teams, which is what I experienced at Livermore Laboratory uh, in the late 70s, and then again at Los Alamos in the early 80s, those could also work, but they were centralized and they, were, they, they had a methodology that was uniform and adopted, um, but distributed large teams, I, I, I think, uh, couldn't really get the work done unless, <laughs> without these tools. There is that, but I would also expect that you would have some challenges with the governance in a distributed, not only physically distributed team members, but also sort of distributed authority that right. characterizes many of the open source codes. That's right. Um, yeah, it's more than just Git. It, it's also the editorial function yes. uh, that has to go along with that. Um, and, you, you know, ultimately you need a, a small number of people who are willing to review the pull requests, you know, and, and, and add them to the branch, to the, the main branch. And, and that's actually where things slow down or break down in my experience. You need people willing to devote the time to process those pull requests. Um, and that actually works into the whole concept question of sustainability. I, I think funding agencies still haven't internalized the fact that sustainability requires time investment in non-scientific activities as well. Yeah, I would turn it around um, mm -hmm. a little bit. I, I think, and this is just my experience, um, before distributed version control, it really wasn't possible or attractive for anybody to make what I would call pro bono contributions free of charge to the project. Um, you were either in or you were out. Um, and so co-development happened on with centralized grants to me in the early days. But once the code achieved a certain critical mass and utility, then with distributed version control and the editorial function that goes with it, uh, I saw that the code grew through small contributions that were just being made asynchronously, if you will, um, and, you know, independently. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the net, the sum of all of those contributions is actually larger than what a, a grant can support typically in astrophysics. And so it's, it's kind of like changing the paradigm from a centrally managed code to a a distributed community organism. So any projects that are starting new or are poised to do a large rewrite of their code for whatever reasons, do you have any words of advice for them? Yeah, um, there's actually a very nice um, paper that Matt Turk, uh, put on the archive called Scaling Code Development in the Human Dimension. And it's all about, uh, this was really, I mean, Matt was the lead developer uh, of YT, which is another large, very successful community code project. And in this paper, he talks about how you have to insist on a spirit of sharing and, um, uh, sort of the social 
contract aspects to a well functioning community code project. And so my first piece of advice would be <laughs> to read um, that. Read that. And then if you're going to be the creator of a community code, adopt those practices. Um, otherwise, you know, it's not going to be a good experience for everybody, for anybody. If you're going to be joining uh, another project, I would, I would look at the sociology of that project and see how it's run and see whether you want to join that club. Because if it's, if it's a happy team like the YT and the Enzo team, it's just a great experience and everyone contributes and shares. I mean, graduate students who are doing development for their PhD thesis, <laughs> share that stuff before they do the PhD. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's remarkable what people are willing to share with the right kinds of um, attitudes. Right. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom uh, before we wind up the interview? Uh, I would. Um, these days, there are so many community codes um, out there. Uh, they, they all take an effort to learn. <laughs> um, I would be very selective with which ones you, you choose and look at the sociology of the, of the uh, group that develops it and uh, you know, jo join a, a team like that. Uh, the other thing is I would say become very familiar with what is on the inside these codes, how they, how they work. We, we don't want, you know, a world filled with uh, people using codes as black boxes. Um, you're, if you're a scientist, you need to do quality science, and that means understanding your tool. Thank you, um, Professor Norman, for joining and for uh taking time out for this interview. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.